So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, first, I, I would like to thank all of you for being here and uh, sharing this uh, time with me. And uh, I would uh, especially like to thank my uh, supervisor, Xavier Serra, who accepted me to this project five years ago and uh, uh, put, uh, made me come into where I am right now. I don't know, in the stage. And <laughs> Uh, another special thanks to the uh, jury members. Uh, I'm really grateful that uh, you all have accepted uh, to be part of my defense. And uh, the last but not the least, I would also like to thank to uh, everyone in, who got involved in Comp Music Project. Uh, some of them are not here. And also my uh, friends from Music Technology Group and some other external collaborators that I have throughout this um, five years of uh, journey that I had. And today, um, I will uh, make my talk in three big segments. And the first will ex uh, start with the introduction. And I will uh, give the motivation and the objectives that I have when I started uh, this uh, doctoral uh, research and how I kind of involved uh, to what it is right now. I will also make a short introduction to the so-called uh, Ottoman Turkish Makam music. And then I will move to the second part, uh, which I will mainly focus on the audio score alignment uh, methodology that I have worked on, which is the basis of the uh, analysis uh, that I use for automatic description. And um, the other bits which I will talk about will be related to this, like how I analyze music scores and audio recordings. But in this presentation, I will only focus on the ones which are really relevant uh, with this bit. And in the end, I will uh, explain how the automatic uh, description, the automatic description I get from the algorithms that I use and its applications for music discovery. So. Uh, automatic content description is uh, one of the most fundamental tasks for um, information technology. Like from a wide perspective, let's say, from spam filters to uh, automatic face recognition, its applications have been showing an incredible progress uh, in the last decade in terms of how the performance, the usability, and how we can actually access these. And in this very context, uh, the automatic description uh, of music is a very relevant research topic in our area, which has many applications in uh, the music information retrieval field, such as music similarity, uh, discovery, recommendation, and uh, it also has uh, benefits to other uh, relevant disciplines, such as uh, computation musicology and music education. And uh, while the music information retrieval uh, is uh, relatively young field. There has been, in fact, many research on developing uh, methodologies, computation analysis methodologies, uh, to obtain an automatic description of music data, let it be music scores, audio recordings, or social data. However, uh, the majority of these technologies are, uh, I would call them somewhat culture specific. And I would say uh, they are, typically designed uh, to analyze the, uh, what uh, I call as the eurogenetic musics. The musics that uh, or somehow have their roots originating from Europe and they share some common musical characteristics. And uh, these technologies do not uh, necessarily scale well to uh, study other music uh, traditions due to some constraints. For example, some of the methodologies, in fact, might be directly applicable, but they might have uh, some constraints over the theoretical framework that they ver work on, uh, such as uh, Western classical music theory. And um, another uh, reason might be that the methods ca could be, and they should definitely be optimized on the music that they are uh, aiming to study. And just as uh, we should use data-driven and uh, content-based solutions, to, uh, for the analysis of eurogenetic musics. We should also aspire the same and uh, we should uh, develop uh, culture-aware methodologies to study other types of music. 
And these methods should be able to address the computational and the conceptual challenges that are posed by the musical characteristics, the performance practice, and uh, if applicable, the music theory uh, related representations that is imposed by the music culture that we are studying. And uh, in my uh, thesis, I have, uh, we had, or uh, in the project, we had the opportunity to, to be able to work in many different music cultures, such as Hindustani music and Carnatic, both from India, also uh, Arab Andalusian music, and other music that originates from both uh, from Spain and uh, also Peking Opera from China. And uh, I choose to uh, work more on the Ottoman Turkish makam music. I also have my personal motivations for this, which I will quickly explain later. But the main reason why I wanted to work on this is that uh, Ottoman Turkish makam music is a prominent music tradition which uh, spans over uh, uh, several centuries. And it has an established performance practice which is still alive and uh, there are uh, throughout centuries we can also find many uh, sources, uh, many scholars who have worked on this music. So this allows us from an uh, engineering uh, perspective that we don't really have to dig into musicological research in order to find this basis that we could work as data. And uh, in my thesis, I primarily uh, wanted to focus on uh, analyzing the audio recordings and music scores. Uh, it's probably because they are the somewhat most relevant representations of the music, and especially when we would like to uh, study the time-varying characteristics, such as the melody or rhythm. And uh, these representations uh, emphasize a particular perspective uh, within the symbolic or the audio domain. And uh, it allows us to uh, make uh, different, it allows us to work in different approximations uh, in the understanding and analyzing the music. So from this point of view, uh, uh, from this point of view, uh, my research was uh, primarily data driven. And uh, there has been an emphasis on uh, generating representative uh, music uh, corpora, either research or test corpora. Uh, so we could study the uh, desired uh, char characteristics of Ottoman Turkish makam music. And um, this is uh, the little bit of personal motivation that I would like to talk about. Uh, in fact, I started working on this music before I started in comp music project. And my master's thesis was about uh, the computational modeling of improvisation in a uh, Turkish folk music form. And one of the conclusions that I got from this is uh, without uh, looking, uh, so in this, uh, in my master's thesis, I only had to work on music scores. And the one of the conclusions that I had was uh, if we only restrict ourselves to music scores, at least in the context of uh, Ottoman Turkish makam music, uh, this is not really enough. Uh, without having any means to uh, address the uh, specificities of the practice, uh, and this was uh, my own criticism to my uh, work that uh, I considered it as a partially complete thing which should be uh, extended later with audio analysis. So, um, parallel to the discussion I uh, gave on the culture aware, uh, awareness of uh, computation methodologies, uh, I believe that the integration of uh, culture aware music descriptions to could greatly enhance the uh, user experience in uh, scenarios dealing with music discovery. Like, um, to be frank, I don't really listen to this type of music in iTunes because it doesn't really give me the, uh, as a, let's say, interested person, it doesn't give me the meaningful information that I would like to see. So uh, for this reason, uh, we, will, we also wanted to focus on the music discovery aspect as uh, one of the main applications for uh, using the automatic description that is part of the uh, part of my research. So the primary objectives I have uh, I had for this uh, research is to first uh, develop uh, the computation analysis methodologies uh, that would uh, 
convey an automatic description of music scores and audio recordings. And uh, from my personal motivation, uh, I wanted to focus more on the audio score alignment-based uh, joint analysis, or let's say the joint analysis, and I thought uh, I saw audio score alignment as the uh, most suitable basis to do such a, uh, such a description. And uh, in order to uh, evaluate and also to capture the characteristics of the music, uh, obviously we need a representative research corpus uh, that, could, uh, that we could use to model the different musical characteristics of this music. And I consider the automatic description as uh, part of this corpus too, such as uh, like the music corpus can always uh, get better uh, like if we add more data or if we curate them, etc., and so can the automatic description uh, could be more enhanced through I don't know uh, semantic web uh, integration or through uh, better algorithms, let's say. And parallel to that, uh, one of the major uh, things we need to, we needed to do was to create data sets, uh, test data sets, so we could evaluate the uh, uh, analysis tasks that we are working on. And uh, you will see that this was one of the main uh, contributions to uh, that we did, not only me, but pretty much everybody in the comp music team working on different traditions. Like, uh, there weren't many open data sets or uh, many research, so we had to define some of the research uh, questions throughout uh, the uh, project too. And finally, um, the ultimate aim for us was to uh, develop music discovery applications that we could uh, use to uh, showcase the automatic description that is uh, part of the, that is the result of my uh, thesis. So, now I will uh, proceed to continue explaining, uh, making a brief uh, introduction to this uh, music. So, um, in a large geographical region of uh, Asia, North Africa, and uh, a little bit in East Europe, uh, there are numerous music traditions which could be described uh, around the uh, concept of makam. The concept within uh, each music culture, within their own understanding, is not equivalent. But uh, they share some uh, certain characteristics within each other. And within these musics, uh, in my thesis, I focused on uh, the so-called Ottoman Turkish makam music tradition. And this term is coined by uh, Cem Behar, one of the prominent uh, musicologists in Turkey. And uh, he explains this uh, music tradition as a uh, city music which had proliferated in the Ottoman Empire, and then it uh, continues its legacy uh, predominantly in the uh, modern Turkey. And uh, this tradition spans over several centuries, and it encompasses a great variety of performance, both in terms of instrumentation and also in voice. And um, we can also uh, discuss the music uh, from different overlapping contexts, such as classical or religious or military and to some extent folk, but I'm not going to enter into the differences uh, within these, uh, I'm not going to enter to the implications of these in, in this talk. So, uh, before I enter to uh, explain the musical characteristics, I actually think uh, it will be better for you to uh, listen a short uh, audio, so things will be more meaningful when uh, I'm discussing the uh, implications of this music. <laughs> Whoop. And there goes the class. <laughs> so uh, this is a short clip from 
one of my uh, best uh, directors, Fatih Akın, a Turkish German uh, director who is living in Germany. And uh, this is from Crossing the Bridge. So if anybody is interested in watching it, I would really recommend. So after the commercials, uh, basically uh, Ottoman Turkish makam music is uh, pre uh, predominantly oral tradition. This means uh, that uh, throughout centuries, the music uh, has actually passed from uh, the masters to the students. And uh, when I was explaining the makam concept, I actually didn't want to uh, explain what it really means, what the word means. So um, basically, makams explain the melodic dimension of this music. And from a very, very general perspective, we can consider makams as uh, modal structures in which the melodies revolve uh, in, uh, around some melodic centers under some certain rules that are dictated by the progressions in that makam. And uh, I'm not going to enter into much of those details, but I just want to make a little point that uh, the final tone uh, is uh, the one the, that is the last melodic center, typically uh, the typical last center. And uh, the pieces usually end with this tone. And throughout the talk, I will uh, name it as, I will call it as tonic, just for the convenience sake. And um, this music also encompasses a great variety of tuning and intonation, as uh, you might have heard from the singing of Musee and Senar, uh, the lady who was singing. And the other thing is, uh, this music tradition offers a high degree of expressivity. So, um, I for example, the musicians are uh, very flexible to add their own embellishments, and they can insert musical notes, uh, they might repeat phrases, and they can also alter the timings uh, as long as they kind of follow the rhythmic structure. And uh, even within the piece, they can play with the tuning and intonation. And as a matter of fact, they are supposed to do that. If, uh, if any musician uh, plays the uh, music uh, like plainly, then they are not really considered good musicians. And on top of it, there is this other concept called heterophony, where uh, musicians, while they are performing simultaneously, uh, they perform the same melodic idea but they put their own interpretation, which uh, is uh, also the part of this high expressivity. And um, the last uh, detail I would like to give is uh, one particular detail, which will come to us later uh, in the audio score alignment uh, explanation. So in this music, there is no definite reference tuning, such as the uh, let's call the popular standard A4 uh, equal to 440 hertz. Uh, there are several tra uh, transpositions which the musicians prefer uh, due to instrument uh, registers or also due to the aesthetics that they would like, but these don't have any definite tuning either. And uh, quickly jumping to the music theory, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there have been uh, many scholars that studied this music throughout centuries. And as a result, there are numerous uh, theories and explanations which attempt to describe this music. And uh, uh, what they have in common is usually that uh, they uh, acknowledge that there are more than 12 notes in an octave. Some say it's 24, some say it's 79, etc which is not really important in the context of this talk, but uh, I would just like to point it out so we, we could remember later that there are uh, more target uh, tones in an octave than what we usually see in, uh, let's say, the popular musics. And, and these are not, uh, in my, in, from a musical perspective, uh, these are not microtones because they are the tones that the musicians play. The intonation aspect and the tuning deviations uh, define what is the microtone, micro, what is microtonality in this music. And um, having said that, uh, I should mention that the mainstream uh, music theory that is uh, 
taught in the conservatories and music scores. Nowadays is the Ariel Ezgi Uzdilek theory, uh, which is uh, which was uh, coined by the, these three musicologists. And uh, they say that there are 20 notes in an octave, and uh, they divide a whole tone into uh, nine in EQ distant intervals that are also called as Holderian or Holdering commas. And uh, we can kind of consider this uh, system as an approximation of uh, 53 tonical tempered uh, system, which uh, kind of equates one Holderian comma uh, into approximately 22 cents. And um, these numbers are not really important. I'm not using them extensively in my own system, but you will see throughout the uh, presentation these numbers like Holderian commas and things. So when I'm talking about musical relevances, uh, these will come in handy. And uh, another point that I would like to make is uh, the theories does not necessarily correspond to practice. And uh, there are several studies which show this too. For example, uh, Barish Boskurt, uh, I think nine years ago, have a uh, paper in JNMR which shows that uh, the tuning uh, aspect is not clearly uh, explained uh, when, uh, when we look at the uh, when we look how the virtuosos uh, play uh, some certain makams. And uh, the music scores are a relatively new addition, or uh, in fact, the, I, I would be wrong if I say that. The uh, contemporary uh, extended Western notation that is used right now is a new addition which uh, more or less uh, started in the start of 20th century, and it was adapted gradually to the uh, music as a complement to the oral practice. And uh, these are typically transcriptions, which are not uh, written by the composers, but some other uh, musicians or musicologists, sometimes even centuries later. So, for example, Jem Behar discusses that the composer's intent, uh, original intent, might have been lost throughout this oral dissemination. And uh, these scores uh, typically notate simple melody lines, as you can see here, which kind of resembles a uh, nursery rhyme, but I will show you in an instance that this is in fact not the case when we look at the performance practice. So I will play a uh, uh, short clip which uh, two prolific musicians, uh, Murat Aydemir and Derya Türkan, uh, play this single measure. And... <laughs> So, uh, has everybody been able to track, like whoever knows sight reading music scores? Well, no need to raise hands. Anyway, so, um, basically I did my own transcription for this, and I'm pretty sure everybody would have their own choices with the decisions. This is just my, uh, just what I wanted to show. Like, uh, within even this short amount of, uh, short duration of music, we can see many uh, performance interactions that are both happening between the musicians and also how they alter a simple melody, as simple as in uh, written in the score. And the last thing I want to mention is the macro structure uh, of the music. So uh, the musicians are also f uh, flexible in um, performing uh, the structure. So they can uh, play uh, different improvisations, taksims, for example, in the start, in the end, and sometimes even in the middle of the piece. And they are also flexible in repeating the sections, and sometimes they uh, can also omit sections too. So here uh, I have talked about these two different uh, representations, let's call, of uh, the music. And uh, from different perspectives, they give a lot of complementary information that we could exploit and use jointly to understand this uh, music better. But on the other hand, we have also seen that these two representations hold some implications which are uh, cons contrasting with each other. 
And um, this uh, basically takes me to the place where, uh, when I started to the Comp Music project in 2011, when uh, I wanted to work on this aspect and trying to figure out how I should approach the problem. And basically, and the, cons the requirements that I had when I was designing the audio score alignment method was, the first was uh, that uh, the alignment method should be able to align uh, the audio, uh, even when there are uh, structure differences that uh, we don't observe in the music score. And I obviously also wanted to have a good alignment, but uh, there is this conceptual challenge that I showed earlier with the uh, music example. So uh, this, was, this turned out to be a, a hard, much harder problem than I, I anticipated later. But still, the main requirement I had to fulfill was the tuning and intonation differences. The, so I needed to find a representation that would allow me to align uh, what is the simple melody line in the music scores with the heterophonic melodies in audio recordings. So um, what I ended up five years later is in a conceptual, uh, let's call conceptually this. Um, the music scores that I analyzed don't have the structure uh, explicitly stated. So the first step I do is to actually find the uh, sections that are in the music score uh, using some heuristics and um, semi-graph uh, analysis. And then I am capturing, uh, I'm synthesizing the melody that is in the mu given in the music score for each uh, section uh, separately. And in parallel, I extract a melodic feature, which could, uh, which I could use to align uh, with the music uh, representation that I got from the music score. However, I should be, uh, this feature that I extract should uh, be invariant to the performance tonic. So I need to take, uh, uh, get this uh, done. And after I do this, um, I first do a structure level alignment by uh, aligning each of the uh, sections in the score independently. And this was a choice that I uh, did in uh, 2012, more or less. Uh, when I was doing this, more or less, uh, the majority of the audio score alignment systems were uh, top down. They tried to align the scores uh, just from the start to the end, which uh, proved out both uh, very problematic for me, and it was also very slow. Like, uh, these kind of systems didn't really work on my four gigabyte laptop, uh, the laptop which I didn't have RAM. And I wanted something fast that I can prototype very easily and uh, work on a large scale data. So um, I try to make this as fast as possible, which I will describe later um, during the relevant bit. And in parallel, I have also uh, worked on node level alignment. And I did this in, uh, I did intersection alignment after I found the structure. And I'm going to uh, dissect each of the components and explain them one by one. So the music uh, format that I, uh, I have used throughout my thesis is uh, this, uh, it comes from this collection called SimTR, which is the phenomenal work of Kemal Karos Manolu, who had uh, done this uh, machine readable uh, trans, uh, transcription slash, uh, or let's say transcriptions from other domains, and he also hit his, his own transcriptions for more or less uh, 20 years. And he now has uh, brought us the biggest uh, music score collection for Ottoman Turkish Makam music. Um, the main implications is this: uh, the original format uh, that we have is a in is, is a tabular format, which uh, gives us the uh, events throughout the time, and it gives us the note symbols, durations, and all the other re relevant information such as lyrics. And as I mentioned. Uh, at this stage, I don't know the uh, sections in the music score. I don't know how many there are. I don't know where they start and end. And I also don't know how they are related with each other. I could use this melodic relation later 
uh, in my audio score alignment system simply by not aligning the same melody again and again. So this is for the performance reasons, more or less. And the concept, uh, the block uh, for the structure analysis is uh, as follows. And uh, this was uh, presented in FMA 2016, this summer. So first I start from uh, extracting the section boundaries using some heuristics. And then I compute, the, I compute melodic similarities between each section that I found. And then I label them uh, according to their similarities and I obtain the structure in the section level in terms of melody. So um, in this format, in the SimTR text format, there are some implicit uh, section boundary information. And by using this uh, and some heuristics, I obtain the section boundaries. And simply by finding it, I'm also getting the section sequence and where they start and end. And then, uh, for each section, I compute a synthetic melody by, uh, by sampling each of the notes uh, according to their duration and uh, also the scale degree uh, according to the tonic symbol. So, for example, uh, this will be 44 uh, Holderian commas because it's the seventh of the tonic. And after I find, uh, I compute the melodic relations, I uh, compute the similarities uh, by using a normalized Levenstein distance, which ge gives me how uh, similar the different sections are. So if it's one, it means they have the identical melody. And then uh, to remove the um, irrelevant connections uh, in this graph that we see, I remove the edges by just doing a simple thresholding on similarities. And then in order to obtain the groups, I uh, make some uh, graph analysis and I basically obtain the maximal cliques in, in, the sub, uh, in the graph that we obtain after thresholding. And finally, uh, I label these uh, groups. First, I label each of the group with a capital letter and then uh, identical melodies will be assigned the same numerical index and different uh, indices uh, if they are similar but somewhat different. So now I got the structure. I can move on the audio analysis part. Here I will only explain the predominant melody extraction step that I'm using uh, in the audio score alignment system. Um, we have tried a couple of predominant melody extraction algorithms uh, after we started the project, such as Yin, Swipe Prime, and uh, Melodia from Justin Salomon. And we eventually ended up uh, making our own variant of Melodia because, uh, of the, because the original algorithm is uh, tailored uh, to study accompany, uh, music styles which have accompaniment. So it was removing many of the relevant uh, melodies that we have. So uh, we did this with uh, when Hasan Sercan Atlı was having a, his Erasmus internship uh, here in 2014, and it was published in, uh, in the same year in ATMM. So now uh, I'm going to explain you the core part of the audio score alignment methodology. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I attempt to align uh, each uh, section one by one. So this is the first, uh, this is the situation we are in now. We have the uh, synthetic melody, the predominant melody, and these boxes show the ground truth that we have where the musicians have performed uh, this section. And as you can see, the predominant melody isn't uh, that close to the synthetic uh, melody. This is somewhat uh, related to the tuning and intonation aspects, but also because of the octave errors that we get through the predominant melody computation. And here, I'm making an assumption, which I will tackle later. So uh, when I compute the predominant melody, we are still in the hertz scale, and we don't know the tonic. Uh, so we have to uh, identify the tonic somehow. Let's just assume that I did this. And what I do is I first compute a distance matrix and I use octal wrapped L1 distance. So 
I can get rid of the octave errors. And uh, I get this kind of representation where we can see a faint line, but we have to emphasize this by making a binary thresholding. And uh, the, binaries, the optimal for the binarization threshold uh, will be explained later in section linking. And then I use this uh, commonly used uh, image processing technique called half transform, which allows me to uh, obtain the line segments. Uh, I basically fit lines into these uh, blobs that could be approximated as lines. And then the uh, projection of these lines uh, are uh, basically the estimations for us, uh, the time intervals that we estimate that the musicians play the, this particular section. Here you see we found all the five correct, but we have a wrong one. And I will also deal with this later in the section linking part. And at this stage, I also compute a similarity for that uh, particular time interval. Uh, by simply uh, dividing the sum of all the similar uh, uh, similar pixels. Like when we do binarization, all the similar nodes uh, will be labeled as one. So it's basically the pixels in here, all the ones divided by the whole length of the path. And now uh, the tonic identification is kind of like a feedback loop that is embedded in the fragment linking, uh, the partial audio score alignment. So what I do is, I first uh, compute a pitch class distribution, and I then get the peaks of the distribution, which, will, which are the stable peaks that are performed in this performance. And assuming each one of them could be the tonic, I normalize the predominant melody, and uh, then I do partial audio score alignment and obtain similarities for different uh, tonics. And whichever tonic uh, candidate gives me the highest similarity, uh, I consider it as the tonic frequency. In order to evaluate it, uh, I'm actually going to explain uh, one experiment I did last month. Uh, I have recently collected 800 audio score pairs. And uh, to evaluate, I'm actually looking at the pitch classes because of the ambiguities that we see in uh, heterophonic recordings. And uh, we have this threshold uh, of one whole daring comma. Basically, the annotation and the estimation, the tonic estimations, they should have uh, less than 22 cents difference in their pitch classes. And uh, in this experiment, uh, there were only 14 errors which uh, yields 98% accuracy. And uh, there has been several other experiments which I explain in the thesis, but the uh, short story is, if we have the music score available, uh, this methodology outperforms all the tonic identification methods that are applied to uh, Ottoman Turkish makam music. So now we have more or less the system uh, we made it uh, automatized for the tonic two. Now it's time to get the most uh, meaningful section sequence from all the candidates that we did. So uh, here, uh, this shows all the uh, partial alignments that I did for this uh, a particular score, which has five sections. So each of these distance matrices, uh, sorry, the binary, binarization matrices, are for one particular section. And these lines uh, show uh, estimations for each section. So the blue line that you see here is the estimation for section one. And as I mentioned earlier, the projection of these lines in the time axis gives us uh, the candidate time. So we can basically aggregate all the estimations that we have. Here, uh, don't be confused by this y-axis. This is just uh, a uh, visualiza for visualization purposes uh, for the graph that I'm going to build. Basically, from this, uh, these estimations, we can connect them in time uh, by checking how many of the uh, sections have their end close to other sections. And this gives us a uh, graph which uh, we can traverse in time. And uh, I have used different variants to uh, obtain the most probable path, which I explained in the thesis. 
but uh, you can use uh, either simple uh, walks uh, in the subgraphs or some Bayesian inference to find this. Uh, and let's say uh, we, uh, we can obtain uh, the most uh, probable path from such a graph representation. And um, I, in, uh, I also, uh, in order to uh, evaluate this method, or let's say a variant of it that was published in JNMR, um, I have collected 257 recordings. And um, after the processing and getting all the sections, I checked whether each uh, of the boundaries uh, of a section uh, lies within the vicinity of plus minus three seconds to its annotations. And I consider it as true if it is and false otherwise. Then I compute uh, the recall precision and F1 to evaluate. And in the experiments, I also check uh, the optimal pitch resolution, the whether the predominant melody is a meaningful feature uh, or better feature than uh, chroma representation. And I'm also trying to find the optimal for the binarization threshold that I am using. So uh, the results uh, were pretty good. So uh, we obtained 0 0.90 for uh, F1 score. So we were able to uh, align most of the score in the sec uh, section level. And the boundaries are very accurate, like we could find them uh, with a mean of uh, less than uh, half a second. And uh, as I was mentioning, I wanted to make the system as fast as possible. So uh, we were also able to achieve this as uh, this system, and this is coded in MATLAB, so it can still be improved more. Uh, it takes only 3% of the duration of the audio recording to complete the section level alignment. On top of it, um, in this experimental setting, the predominant melody outperformed uh, HBCPs, the chroma uh, variant that was uh, proposed by Emilia Gomez in his uh, thesis. And then um, I found that the uh, binarization threshold was around 50 cents, which is somewhat musically meaningful because of the uh, number of uh, intervals that we have are, uh, it kind of fits into what the musicians play. And we also solved the same thing for pitch resolution. So uh, we, dis we concluded that uh, we can work on a pitch resolution, which is around 50 cents. But if we want better, let's say, note level alignment, we can still use more precise versions. And in 2015, with Andre Holzaffel and Umut Shimshekli from uh, Thailand Jemgiz group in Boas University, we also compared it, uh, this section linking methodology with a uh, more sophisticated hierarchical hidden Markov models. And uh, we have seen that uh, both systems give comparable uh, results in terms of performance, like finding the boundaries. Here, uh, this is the system that I was explaining you, and this is their uh, hierarchical hidden Markov model. And, but we saw that the H, HMMs are better in temporal alignment. And this makes sense because half transform is just a linear uh, approximation of the alignment path. But I should note that the system that they have proposed is a top-down process. And it cannot handle um, events which are uh, in the audio recording, which are not related to the uh, music score. So if there is any improvisation or even a speech or 20 seconds of silence, this system will fail, unfortunately. So the final thing I did uh, for audio score alignment was to uh, do note level alignment. Because of the conceptual challenges it posed and because we didn't have a lot of data uh, uh, three years ago uh, when I was doing this, I didn't put a lot of effort in this. But I did, uh, uh, with Sankalp Gulati, we, uh, uh, we use subsequence DTW uh, to find the intersection alignments in the node level. And uh, with a short, uh, with a small data set of uh, six recordings and around 4,000 nodes, we were able to get 66 uh, F1 measure with a 200 millisecond tolerance. 
And the final thing, uh, as I was mentioning, like the alignment system is meant uh, to make a joint analysis of these sources. One thing uh, we did after obtaining the alignments is to actually improve the features that we had already computed, such as uh, correcting the octave errors in the predominant melodies. And we also enhance uh, some of the features that are already computed, such as uh, the note models, uh, which were described by Gopal Koduri more in detail in the morning. But just to put it short, uh, in this representation, each note symbol has a histogram that is computed from the aligned notes that we see in here. And to summarize the audio score alignment part, um, I basically, I was able to uh, etch, uh, make a system which addresses several cu culture-specific challenges that is brought by this music, such as the heterophony and the uh, transpositions, etc. And uh, my initial goal was also met, more or less, uh, because it's fast and it's also accurate in finding the sections. Uh, but there are two downsides. One is, uh, while uh, throughout my PhD, I have made a variance for each task, uh, which uh, kind of helped me to better tackle, like I approach it from more a uh, task and data-driven approach. But this also meant that I have now a lot of variants uh, which differ a little bit. And there needs to be a comparative experiment within these variants, like uh, half versus subsequent TTW, and different features in a more general way for different tasks. Uh, so we could actually uh, merge these variants and make a more generalizable um, approach. And then the second and obvious one is that there is still room to improve in the node level alignment. Um, last year, I started uh, uh, collecting data with uh, the students of Barış Boskurt on this, and now we have a uh, relatively representative data set uh, for audio score alignment. So this is also one of the next uh, steps that I would like to take in this direction. And uh, moving to the last part, um, this actually also coincides uh, in the timing in 2014 when I was finishing the audio score alignment uh, methodologies that I'm working on and when we had the a proper uh, corpus uh, that we had been building for the last three years. So at this point, we were ready to uh, work on automatic description. So um, just before entering to the automatic description part, I would like to give you a brief statistics about the corpus. Uh, when we initially started in 2011, uh, we, had, uh, we had to collect a lot of data because the sources that we wanted to study, uh, such as the music scores and other recordings, weren't really available. Kemal Karosmanoğlu, uh, thanks to him, we had the music scores just a couple of months after, so we didn't have to do a lot of stuff on that. But, for example, in this uh, last uh, three years, I'm the maintainer of the SIMTR dataset, and uh, we are still curating it with Kemal. And, uh, in the meantime, we had to find all the audio recordings and we needed to label these recordings with the proper metadata. And while doing this, we actually uh, made some uh, certain criteria, which was coined by Xavier Serra. And these are namely the purpose, coverage, completeness, quality, and reproducibility. And now I'm going to represent, uh, now present the latest statistics that, was, uh, that I got in December. So right now we have uh, 6, 000, more than 6,500 audio recordings in this uh, corpus. And the latest version of SIMTR 2.4 has 2,200 recordings. The number of recordings hasn't changed in the last three years. But as I mentioned, uh, we have been curating it with Kemal, so the content gets better and better. And uh, on top of it, we store uh, more than 13,000 uh, instances of metadata in uh, the Open Music Encyclopedia, Music Brains. And we also have the uh, 
interrelations which connect all these entities together in a structured manner. And um, using the uh, computational analysis methodologies that I have uh, developed, either by myself or with collaboration with other members of the Commusic project and also some interns, uh, we have uh, analyzed first the music scores individually and then the audio recordings and then the, we did a joint analysis of them. So the first uh, thing is the scores and uh, here we applied the structure analysis that I explained in the start of the audio score alignment section. And uh, by doing this analysis, uh, we obtained more than 21,000 sections labeled semiotically. Uh, and then using uh, the state-of-the-art phrase segmentation method that is proposed by Boskurt, uh, we were able to obtain the phrase boundaries in these music scores. And we also applied the same uh, semiotic labeling that uh, allowed us to obtain almost 50,000 labeled phrases in these music scores. And for all the uh, collection that we, for all the scores in the collection, uh, we also provide the structured metadata that is either parts from the music scores or crawled from music brains, from the relevant work. And we also validate these uh, automatically to verify whether the informations are the information within these uh, two sources hold with each other. And for the audio um, analysis part, uh, we have implemented more or less the state of the art that is uh, that has been done by Barış Boskurt uh, during and prior to the Comp Music project. And uh, while doing this, uh, with several uh, students of Barış when they came to here in uh, their Erasmus Plus internship and later uh, we had another intern from Turkey, uh, we improved some of these methodologies, such as the predominant melody extraction I mentioned, and also the tonic identification and makam recognition. And these are more or less the state of the art. They became the state of the art uh, for these tasks. And uh, by applying all the audio analysis methods, we have also obtained the automatic description of the uh, whole audio collection. And now we have uh, such a representation where we have the individual analysis that spans from the uh, computational methods that only check either the music scores or the audio recordings. And by applying the joint uh, analysis that is based on the audio score alignment methodology, we were able to uh, get first link uh, the different uh, these two different representations in different granularities, such as the document level, the section level, and we also aligned them in the note level. And in parallel, we also obtained the enhanced uh, features that uh, we got from, uh, that we improved by, uh, by referring to the alignment. And some of these uh, are, uh, this is not indicated here, but for example, tempo identification, uh, we also have a, a score informed tempo identification that is based on audio score alignment. And uh, still the tempo tracking slash identification and uh, like rhythmic things uh, that are only relying on audio analysis are uh, in their baby steps. Like Andre Holzapfel and Ajay Shinivasamurti has been working on this aspect and they have recently started uh, making some progress in uh, tracking the uh, rhythmic structures and things. So this also allows us, uh, the joint analysis allows us to uh, capture some of the features which are in fact very difficult uh, if we only rely on the audio recordings. And these are the uh, basic statistics that we obtained. So 18,000 sections, more than 750,000 notes and 85 hours of time aligned audio uh, data, which is, uh, to my best knowledge, is one of the biggest uh, aligned uh, data that we have uh, currently. And I have also started uh, in the last couple of months on capturing some of the general statistics for uh, to 
understand if we can make some musicological uh, findings from this data. So now it's in its very basics, but I would like to show some of the things that I have found. For example, now uh, we can find what are the most common transpositions that are uh, performed in this uh, in the audio collection. And uh, the results I'm showing come from the joint analysis part, which is more reliable than the audio analysis counterpart. And we can also find uh, what is the tempo deviations uh, that the musicians show, either intra-performance uh, and also across different performances. And we, uh, in addition, we can also uh, see what is the uh, deviation of the musicians from, let's say, a nominal tempo that is indicated by musicologists or the transcribers of the score. And coming to the final part, um, now we have the automatic description. Uh, in last, uh, f not this, but the previous fall in 2015, we started working on um, making a, a music discovery application, a web-based application that uh, we could showcase uh, our findings in this project. And uh, all the music corpora, the automatic description included, and the related software tools and the music discovery application that I mentioned, we, uh, uh, we hold them in this uh, web-based uh, service called Dunya, uh, which its little translation means the world. So it's the realm of uh, the music traditions that we work. And <coughs> um, we, ha we have created this kind of service. So people, uh, especially researchers, can access the data, the algorithms, and the automatic descriptions that we found, uh, that we obtained throughout this uh, research. And uh, on my side, all the uh, computational analysis methods that I have been uh, mentioning, in the last uh, six, seven months, I have uh, made a open and uh, open implementations of them available. And I have created this comprehensive and easy to use toolbox, which is named as Turkish Ottoman Makam Music Analysis Toolbox, or in short, Tomato. <laughs> and uh, this, uh, all these algorithms power the music discovery application that uh, we have made. Uh, I have worked mostly on the int uh, integration of the computation analysis part, and it was Andres uh, Ferrero who did the interface and the management, also with the help from uh, Alistair Porter. So we can also open internet, but just to be safe, I created a video. So we can see how the interface is. So this is an improvisation that you are hearing where the algorithm has decided it's not in the score because it's not. So, and in addition to this, uh, Hasan Sergen Atlı, one of the students of Barış Bozkurt, uh, has finished his master's and he moved to here this summer. And he started working on this uh, desktop-based application, which is called Dünya Desktop. It is right now more or less equivalent to the Dünya web that we have, but this is designed more uh, for, uh, for, it's easy to, uh, for to make it easy to uh, extendable so that you know, we can uh, make specific uh, annotation tools, create data sets, and observe uh, different characteristics of music as we would like. And uh, as the conclusions, uh, within my uh, doctoral research, uh, I have contributed uh, to many uh, different uh, bits that we worked on Com music project. But if, we, if I would like to summarize these, uh, the first one in terms of chronology was the 
uh, Ottoman Turkish Makam Music Corpus that we created and we have been, uh, we are still uh, curating it. So this corpus holds uh, more than 6,500 audio recordings, 2,200 uh, music scores from Kemal Karosmanoğlu's collection and the relevant metadata. These are highly curated, uh, checked by several musicians, musicologists, and also by us. And the creation uh, efforts still continue. And uh, as I mentioned, this is a collaborative effort. So this is not my uh, contribution per se, but uh, for the Ottoman Turkish Makam Music Corpus, or uh, at least the metadata part, I was the one who uh, entered the most metadata, and it was painful. And uh, from here, uh, from the, uh, for the corpus, uh, sorry, starting from the corpus, we obtained the automatic description of these uh, scores, audio recordings, etc. And we obtained 85 hours of time-aligned audio data. And all this data, including the scores uh, and the automatic description, except the uh, audio, audio recordings which are commercial, uh, you can access them through the uh, Dunya API, uh, through the PyCom Music uh, <coughs> package that we have uh, hosted in uh, MTG GitHub. And uh, we use this automatic description to facilitate the music discovery applications that uh, we have uh, developed together. And my main contribution in this thesis lies as the uh, audio score alignment methodology uh, that is uh, used to make the joint analysis of the audio recordings and scores. So it can handle the structural uh, differences and transpositions, uh, intonation, characteristics of Macam musics and such. And it is robust to heterophony, uh, non-notated expressions that we don't see in the music scores, and uh, the system is fast and accurate in the section level. And from the alignment, we also use it uh, in various tasks uh, to obtain several features, which will be very hard to uh, extract directly from audio analysis, and we also improved some of these audio features too. And this methodology has been already adapted to Carnatic music, as Kopal explained in the morning. And Andre Holzapfel had also adapted parts of it uh, for audio to audio alignment uh, for uh, computational musicology studies in creative music. And uh, from the greater picture, I worked on uh, more than eight uh, symbolic and audio analysis tasks, which pretty much covers uh, all of the, not all, but almost all of the tasks that had been applied to Makam music. I haven't worked on any rhythm things, so if you need to ask stuff, it is Ajay or Andre. But the others, I think I might help. And uh, some of these tasks, we have also, ad uh, the adaptations became the state of the art, such as the uh, Makam recognition and tonic identification. And in order to uh, analyze, uh, in order to evaluate these uh, the methodologies that we developed, uh, I have created uh, with collaborations with other people seven test data sets. And uh, in addition to this, uh, two with Georgi Cambazo for audio and uh, lyrics uh, alignment, which is Georgi's main work. I more or less supplied the data and the uh, musical knowledge. And this has been published in uh, Around, I think it's exactly 20 publications, uh, and 16 of them are uh, within the context of the thesis. The other four are, again, with Georgi Cambazo on audio lyrics alignment. And um, in the very end of my uh, work, uh, when I obtained all the automatic description, etc., I have realized how important, uh, you know, aligning them is not the uh, unless you have a semantic layer, it wouldn't help that much for uh, uh, exploitation reasons. So I started with Gopala Koduri uh, working on an Ottoman Turkish Makam music ontology, which uh, describes the 
symbolic aspects, the performance aspect, and the theoretical aspects. But uh, we still haven't verified it with uh, real, like by applying it to our uh, descriptions and the metadata. And uh, again, in the final year, I have uh, realized how important, like while I was implementing the audio analysis methods that were already there, I realized like how important it is to actually not to reinvent the wheel. So uh, this made me uh, ma make a push on uh, reproducible research. And we started uh, opening the data uh, already. So this is uh, not a, I I'm not a uh, spare head on this or anything. But I could say that we now have the data uh, open and all the data generated and uh, the corpus material uh, within the part of the comp music project and it's uh, easily accessible via web and uh, we have this uh, open source code uh, of all the implementations of the algorithms in tomato and uh, my final papers are uh, designed to be fully reproducible and this is the last slide so as a future work I see that I didn't have time to unify the audio score alignment techniques that I've worked on. So this is the first natural thing I think I should do. And uh, the, in the meantime, I think it is uh, important uh, to uh, improve these analysis methodologies, either audio score or joint, by incorporating deep learning somehow, because we have been seeing like they actually help a lot. And, Two examples I have in front of me are, uh, the first is Colin Raphael's thesis, which dealt with uh, composition identification. Uh, and uh, he did this by directly using deep learning in his identification system. And the other uh, way is to enhance uh, the feature extraction uh, step. For example, in this paper uh, that was recently published in Izmir 2016 uh, enhances the chroma features that could be later used uh, for uh, uh, chord estimation and such. And uh, now we have the data set. Uh, my, uh, my other interest is to make corpus-based analysis uh, for musicological studies and possibly for music education. I have showed you a couple of the statistics the basic statistics I've already captured. And then finally, uh, from the ontology part, uh, which I wasn't really able to deal a lot, uh, I will actually build on top of this, uh, the ontologies, uh, first by validating them, and second by incorporating these into Tomato and uh, Dunya Web, so people could use it uh, in a more semantically meaningful way.